Okay, yeah, and let's just open up in prayer a moment. Lord, we do thank you for your word as always, Lord. And I'm always excited to study and to learn new things about you, Lord, about your nature, about your plans and purposes, the mm-hmm. plan of salvation. And Lord, as uh, most of us, again, kind of excited when we see things happening in the Middle East, Lord, and there's nothing wrong about being excited and, and seeing the way things come, Lord, because our salvation isn't wrote in ourselves, it's wrote in the blood of our dear Lord and Saviour, Jesus. So I just pray this morning, Lord, that um, I preach you a heart, yes. and Lord, that uh, we might see Jesus in it all, Lord, and that might be reflected in our attitudes towards others. We're supposed to be living epistles, Lord, so help us in that arena as well, as we study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, amen. Right, where's my Bible? I've got all my Bible verses on a tablet, so the reason I'm fetching my Bible, I wanted to see this Bible, okay? Do you notice how well kept it is? I rub dubbing in it, you know when I read it? I put cotton gloves on, I look at the pages, and I use a little pointer to flick the pages over, because I love my Bible, and I look after it. Not like some you come here last week and throws his Bible in the corner and lets a dog chew it. Now, those of you who are here, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but those that want, it'll be, it'll be a mystery to you. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart showed us his Bible. It was all ripped and well used. Okay, that's, that's the joke of the way. Anyway, let's get started. <laughs> okay, then. Um, you know, I hope you know, that everyone here is, is really serious about their faith. I think you all are. Shouldn't even have to ask the question. Some people have a flippant attitude, don't they, you know, when it comes to such things. Uh, I remember when I was first saved, um, this chap, a customer of ours in the garage, when I told him, you know, that I'd become a Christian and all that. Oh, he said, I'm a Christian as well, you know, and uh, I thought, well, did, your life don't seem to reflect it. And I've known you for a long time, never said anything about it, you know, it's probably just a go to church Sunday Christian kind of thing. You know, we are, after all, talking about our life eternal. If we talk about eternal life compared to this little snippet of life, surely we should be serious about it, isn't it? And you think about it, quite a lot of predecessors give their life rather than deny their faith in Jesus. And Jesus himself said, you know, dismember yourself if your member's going to leave you into hell. Now, I know it's hyperbolic language and we shouldn't go around cutting our hands off and things, but I get the idea that Jesus wanted us to be serious about our faith, to take our faith seriously, yeah? I can't believe I can say this, but I can. I have spent decades, wow, I guess now, trying to get people not to divide over what we call secondary issues. You know that motto we got on our um, YouTube channel, in essentials, you know, unity, non-essentials, liberty and all else, charity or love. And... Um, you know, it's all, when I say we, we don't divide over secondary issues, in regards to what we understand is a long-established evangelical understanding of doctrine, isn't it? What the church has always believed, really. We know the scriptures speak of a divisive man as someone to avoid. But that's not exactly what it says. Now, you're always talking about divisiveness and all that. Well, this morning, I'm looking at it from a different angle. And so this morning, I'm going to tell you that you need to be divisive. Sometimes. Sometimes divisiveness is needed. Romans 16, 17 states this. Now, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are Such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Notice the ones you avoid are those that are divisive in regards to incorrect teaching that was established by the apostles. When it comes to incorrect teaching or doctrines, and you are to be divisive in that you don't want them to separate you from the truth. And who is the truth? 
That's Jesus, isn't it? Now, there's an unflattering remark there at the end that these folks get deceived the heart, minds of the simple. Well, what does it, it mean by that? So I want to explain the way simple mind here is speaking of. I know in some translations it may say naive. Now the Greek word is archon, archakon, which is explained as pertaining to being unsuspecting or naive with regards to possible deception. It may be possible to spell out the implications of archakon in Romans 16, 18 by translating the minds of people who do not suspect lies. So it's not you know, being simple or anything. In other words, it's people who are young in the Lord or don't have a further grounding in Scripture that can be easily led astray. And, you know, after debating many different faiths over the year, the cunningness, and, you know, some Scriptures are complex, isn't they? And doctrines are complex, and it's easy to get people to stray off the fat path. And I know a lot of people who have. I know people in my previous church who have become Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, then, I think we can establish that there is a key word, unnecessary divisiveness, and key word, necessary divisiveness. So, what are the things that we are to be divisive about? Things, obviously, which are dangerous to your salvation. Those things that get you to wander off the narrow path, so to speak. Those things that make merchant of you. You know, we have basically three categories of thought that can be dangerous to our walk with our Lord. The first one we will look at is our understanding of Jesus' command to his disciples. In Matthew 20, 18, 28, 18, it states, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, to observe all the things that I have commanded you. So Jesus speaking to his apostles, I'm commanding you, all the things I taught you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and so on, teach them, teach us. That's us, isn't it? And lo, I'm with you even to the end of the ages. Amen. So the apostles were to teach us to observe all the things that Jesus commanded them. And where do you find those things? In the scriptures, isn't it? In the word. Yes. Is the Bible hard to understand? Some things are hard to understand. Some things are easy and plain and simple. Scripture even says as much in 2 Peter 3.15. It says, also our beloved Paul, because he was a theologian, wasn't he? According to the wisdom given him, has written to you, also in his, all his epistles or letters, speaking of them, these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught, and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. It's all going on back then. There's nothing new under the sun. They had Gnosticism, the Gnostics. Back at that time, we've got all sorts of things now, and we Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Ari Krishna, goodness knows what. But the main issue back in them days was the Gnostics. And if you heard, oh, look at this Bible, and the church never knew anything about this, this book, this book, of, was it, the Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas? They didn't know about this. It's a Gnostic gospel. The church never accepted it. You know, but anything they can grab on and discredit the church, they will, won't they, you know? These things that are hard to understand. Which kind of things? Things that are complex. complex, And they're distorted and twisted by these unscrupulous people. People who you need to be divisive with. So what is the answer? Well, We've always told you to get completely familiar with the scriptures, don't we? That's number one on the list. You know, read it over and over again and get basic layout of, you know, salvation history. I think it's technically called, it's called Helleskasista. It's a German word. I don't know why we've got to explain things which in English, salvation history, and then give a German version of it to make it sound like you're educated. But you know, that's the way they do it. They, say they do the same things with plants, don't they? Give them Latin names, and nobody knows who they are. It's a tomato. What's the matter with you? Or if you're from America, tomato. Ah. So where do our teachers fit in today? Now, I have a library full of commentaries, uh, Bible dictionaries, Bible aids, over the years, it's, you know, it's built up and if, if done evaluation on it, it's probably a fortune's worth of books there. But to be honest now, everything you need is online. 
Bible Hub, Bible Gateway, BibleStudyTools.com. It's got everything that you need. Just one thing to remember, right? All commentaries are written by men. And I'm not saying, you know, they will have uh, the author's slant or biases. They're not being dishonest. It's just a fact of life. When we come to read the Bible, we read it through glasses which are tinted with, you know, Western ideas and modern day thinking. So the whole idea of biblical interpretation, which is called exegesis, is to get back into the shoes of the original audience that was being written to. And, you know, what was the author's intent in writing this letter? Because letters, the epistles, if you think about it, are one-sided argument. It's like some, you're in somebody on the phone and they're, you know, having a discussion with somebody else and, well, what's he talking about? He's talking about this, so he must be saying this. So it's a one-sided argument, so you can extrapolate from the scriptures what the argument is about. So we all bring our biases to the table. So I never go on one person's opinion, but I try to look as many views about a particular scripture that I may have doubts about the way that it's interpreted as possible, because if you get an average, you're going to get pretty close to what it means, isn't it, you know? So thereby, you know, as much as possible, eliminating as much by us. Now, the same with your Bible. You read, it should be translated from the biblical languages by a committee of men coming from different denominational backgrounds. Now, nearly all the Bibles that we use, you New King James, um, even the King James Version, the NIV, uh, the ASV, it's all done. It's a committee-based translation. That means it's a team of translators. So, say, let's say, for argument's sake, we've got a, a Pentecostal translator there, and he wants to fetch out some things about the Holy Spirit or something like that, you know, charismatic kind of things. Well, then you're going to have somebody from a Reformed church there as well. No, no, that's not. And another one. And they get together, team effort, and they decide the way it should be translated. So, gets rid of your biases. So, you shouldn't have a translation of the Bible translated by one individual person. And, and there are them Bibles out there. Not all of them are bad, to be honest with you. So, where are we? So what about the teachings, doctrines that we are to be divisive about? Well, primarily, we have to have the Jesus that is described in Scripture, isn't it? I think that goes without saying. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 4, and Jesus answered and said then, Take heed. That no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And Paul echoes the thought in 2 Corinthians 11 3. But I fear lest somehow, as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For he who comes and preaches another Jesus, another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. So there's big issues going on there in the Corinthian church. The one-sided argument. Why is he fetching this? They must have been putting up with this kind of thing. A different Christ. Who could possibly fall for that? You know, he's blonde-eyed, blonde, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norseman, and he most of the pictures. I know that, that you know, the pictures of Christ um, are wrong, but we're not talking about images of Christ, are we? We're talking about the descriptions of Christ that we get from the Scripture and who he is. And I'm fascinated, I know I've said this before, by charismatic people who can manipulate the crowds, from dictators like Adolf Hitler right through into religious groups. You know, the worst I think we got is somebody like David Koresh, isn't it, you know? claiming that he was the Messiah. Now, think about this guy claiming to be the Messiah. These people all got a Bible, right? His followers, and there's quite a few of them. And what was he doing? Well, many believed so much that he was the Christ that they give their lives to the movement. But here's a weird thing. They even give their underage children to have sex with him. Where would you find that in the Bible, especially as relating to Jesus Christ? Scripture tells us that, um, you know, untaught and unstable people twist the Scriptures and people believe it. What is in the human psyche that can allow such manipulation? It fascinates me. 
Trust your leaders, yes. The Bible tells you to trust your leaders, but not blindly. Never put any man on a pedestal. I don't care who they say they are. They're all fallible, sinful men, all women for that matter, with the same desires and fears as you. You really need to understand that. Don't fall into a trap of man or woman worship. And I, I don't mean, you know, bowing down before. Although we've seen examples of that now. But, you know, I, I myself got caught up that, you know, we, the gospel was preached, we believed, and we went to fellowship, and we just felt everybody was exactly the same as us. Believed Christ, you know, our lives changed. We wouldn't steal, we wouldn't lie anymore. We just felt that everybody else is the same, and our leaders in the church, we adored them and loved them and they loved us and you know no doubt they'd done the best for us that they could but man will always let you down all of the I, there's not many mainline teachers pastors and so on that i followed through the years that i got fascinated with that this guy is good that i haven't failed in some shape or another I mean, I used to follow Aunt Anagraf, the Bible answer man. I thought, oh, this is brilliant stuff. And he goes and joins the Eastern Orthodox Church there. Mm. You know, and many men have fallen our way. Think about the people that, um, you know, I'm not saying any, they weren't good teachers either, but mm. the way they've gone after, like, you know, I just don't understand it. There's only one, isn't there, who is beyond reproach. Mm. And that's Jesus. And you'll find him in the text of scriptures. Mm. So, it's something, so if it's something you don't agree with me, and let me just tell you now openly, challenge me. I'm not above reproach. I'm not infallible. I'm not like a pope anyway. <laughs> now, I used one of the worst examples there, didn't I? David Koresh, he's one of the worst. There are different degrees of control. Like I said, my stories of leaders who said they were further up the rung of the ladder, you know, than me. And therefore, God would give them more insight and I should follow their instruction. Now, let me just tell you, right? Yes, yeah, some of us are a bit more clued up on Scripture than others. And we've got that insight. But when people said, Say that, or like, you know, in the church I'm higher than you, so God is communicating with me before you. That is a lie, okay? It took me a while before I, I realized that God wasn't even communicating with them at all. They were just tacking on God said and then their own thoughts and desires. We had the apostles and prophets in our movement that spoke on God's behalf long ago. But Scripture tells us that these last days, his son, yeah. isn't there, has spoken. Yeah. And you know what? That's good enough for me. Yeah. That's sufficient for me. That's all I need. Yeah. And I've proven for the last two and a half decades, well, that's the bedrock. That's the sure foundation and not the quicksand of men saying, thus saith the Lord, or the Lord said to me, I tell you, you've got to, you know, and there's lots of people, lovely people will say that. And I don't think they really realize what they're saying. You need to beware of men or women who might have good intentions at heart when they say it. I can guarantee you, right, that 99.99999% of the time, that all that's happening there, when folks say that, all they're trying to do is add an authority to what their own sinful minds want yeah, to say. Yeah. And the poor saps that believe it, obey it unquestionably. I'm not being unkind because I was a poor sap as well. That na naively obeyed, you know, at one time. And I look back and I think, why was I so blind? I can remember going once out and we were going to do an evangelical outreach in a local town centre and the pastor was coming along. And I just happened to suggest, um, don't you think, I can't even remember exactly what I suggested, but don't you think this might be a, a better approach if we go blah, 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 blah. And he shot me down, like, you know, just slam dunked me to the floor. He said, 
don't you think God has given me the right way to do this thing? And I can categorically say, no, no, he didn't. So we have to have the right Jesus going back on track. Some groups say that Jesus is just one of many sons of God. The Bible says he's the son of God, okay? He's got a definite article. Some say he's the archangel Michael. Some say he's just a lesser God in the pantheon of God. Some even say that you can become a God. Hopefully we think that's crazy. However, some say that you already are a God and a little God with a lower cap, G. And that's not in some crazy minority group. That's in the charismatic circle of evangelical Christianity. I can remember watching a video once and the guy name was, the surname was Dollar. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And he had all the people in his congregation chanting, we are gods, we are gods. So what does scripture say about Jesus? Of course, the most go-to place for Christians, isn't it? You know, Jesus is God, is John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, there you have it. And that's true. But remember what untaught and unstable men do, you know, with Scripture, that don't fit their agenda or their denomination? They'll twist them, won't they? You give this answer to your JW friend that comes knocking on your door and see what they say. It'll go something like this. How could Jesus be with God and be God at the same time? It, it makes no sense. It makes sense to you because you don't assume something called Unitarianism. One person, one God. That is that God is just one person, isn't it? They do, so it doesn't make sense to them. To them, God, Jehovah, is the Father only. The New World Translation Bible reflects this, which states, in the beginning was a word, and a word was with God, and a word was a God. He was in the beginning with God. And I even point out to you that other Bibles have a God in them as well, in, instead of God. I'm trying to prove their point. So how do other Bibles have a, a God in them? Well, it's something I just told you. They all have one thing in common. None of them are Bibles translated by a committee of scholars to iron out the preconceived biases. Some are a little unclear now because languages change. I know if you, anybody heard of the Moffat's Bible? Yeah. Well, Moffat was a, a great scholar. Again, it's not a committee-based translation. It's just done by one scholar, Moffat. But Moffat was a Trinitarian and he was a great scholar, no doubt about it. But he translates John 1.1 1, 1 this way. The Logos existed in the very beginning, because that's the underlying Greek word for word. It means wisdom and knowledge, basically, right? The Logos existed in the very beginning, so that's great. The Logos was with God. The Logos was divine. That is okay back when it was written. Moffat, like I say, was a good scholar. The problem is, is with the word divine, isn't it? Now, I, you know, I know what Moffat meant, right? He meant of the same substance as the Father, which is actually a better rendering than God, to be perfectly honest. You know, the Father and the Holy Spirit, the problem is divine these days have many different connotations, don't it? We can say, well, dinner was divine. Or angels are divine. And of course, then you get the unscrupulous people will home in on that and say, even Moffat says Jesus is not a God. But I know that's not what Moffat meant. The very latest translations, the NET is, is a good one, have it written this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. The word was God in the beginning. Now, it's also got a footnote as an alternative to that. And it says, and what God was, the word was, which is an excellent translation. I'm not going to get into the, the Greek of, uh, uh, of John 1.1. 1, 1. It's, it's super complex. Uh, but we have something called, um, it's got a definite article. Now, you haven't got the definite article when it comes to says that Jesus is God, right? 
So does that mean it's indefinite and therefore an A-God? Well, there is no indefinite article in the Greek, so it can't mean that. So the only other thing it can mean is it's qualitative. In other words, the quality of this, what they're saying is that God is of the same essence as the God that he is with. That's what it means. Lord, give me my memory back. Okay. Then we have the real gospel. What is the real gospel? Paul gives us the answer in 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received and in which you stand, with which also you were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Christ dies for our sins once and for all, Again, this is a, a non-negotiable uh, gospel. We all know that it's not based on what we can do. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves, a gift of God, lest anyone should bo- boast. It's implicit in Scripture. So how can anyone get it wrong? Why would they want to change it? JWs believe to have a chance in the resurrection, because you don't go to heaven when you die, you're just dead in the grave and non existent. You have to work for the watchtower until you know you get enough credits, and nobody knows how many credits you've got, so you've never got assurance of salvation. So it's a nice little ploy in it to get you to work for them, basically. Mm-hmm. And until recently, you had to fill in the time card and put on, on the hours that you are to do, but they've just rescinded that within a matter of last month. Mormons, in their uh, Book of Mormon, states that you're saved by grace through faith. Well, that's good, isn't it? But then they tack on after everything you can do. Again, the Mormons want you to go on missionary duty, don't they, for a couple of years and all the rest. It's just get you to work. I'm not sure if it's two years or something like that. And then you have the Hebrew and the Torah uh, root observant believers that you still have to keep the law. Do you know this is the main way that you can know if the faith people claim to have is Christian? That's one of the main things. You just have to ask, what do I have to, be, have to do to be saved? Well, it's nothing, is it really? Just believe, isn't it? If it's more than that, than that, then you've got to be divisive. What about Jesus' resurrection? You think there would be no argument, would you, about that? Surely, especially when Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 12 onwards. Now, if Christ has preached to you that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is empty. Forget it. Go home. Eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow you die. The JWs don't believe that Jesus was resurrected in the same body as he dies in. He was somehow evaporated into dust and a new body then was fashioned up for him. And why do they believe this? I don't really know, you know. Why would they fetch out such a fanciful doctrine? I think it's something to do with spirit and body. But some of the arguments they put in, remember the two men on the road to Emmaus? Mm. And they were discussing the resurrection. Jesus came along and they didn't recognize him. So he was in a different form. Mary Magdalene didn't recognize him, did she? At the tomb? Must have been a different form. It's a spirit body, you know, in a different form. However, a close examination of the scriptures revealed that it was they that had been prevented from recognizing Jesus. Now, we can do that. We can put a, you know, a a mask on or something, can't we? How much more can God do it? You know, what every time he does something with their eyes or whatever. He can turn water into wine. He can do anything. The JWs understand the resurrection turns Jesus into a liar, doesn't it? When Jesus appeared to his disciples and they thought they had seen what? A ghost. But they don't believe it's anything like a spirit or a ghost. Now, if there's no such thing as spirits, right? This um, immaterial part of us that is separate from the flesh, like Paul said, you know, he dwells in this earthly tent. 
why is it that they thought, the Jews at that time thought that they'd seen a ghost or a spirit? Because they obviously believed that you could see one. And did Jesus correct them on it? Don't be so soft. There's no such thing as a spirit or a ghost. He didn't say that, did he? What did he say? Behold my hands, my feet. That is, I myself handle me for a ghost or a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Notice how he left out the blood. There is one place, mind you, that says Jesus was resurrected in a different form in the Bible which now leads us into the theology of our understanding of Scripture. In Mark 16, 9, it says this, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him, as they had mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form. The two of them, as they walked and went into the country, obviously the two on the road to Emmaus. This is a contradiction, folks. we got a genuine contradiction in the Bible. What are we going to do? It's there. There's no good arguing about it, is there? I know some of you know what I'm talking about. Now, I believe this was an addition to Scripture by a well-meaning scribe who inserted this due to a misunderstanding of the Scriptures we just read. They didn't, understand, they didn't know who he was. Yeah? And I have a good reason to believe this. I have a footnote explaining the problem in the NET Bible and was written by the renowned biblical text and languages expert, Daniel B. Wallace, and he says, the Gospel of Mark ends at this point, chapter 16, 8. In some witnesses, including two of the most respected manuscripts, the following shorter ending is found in some of them. They reported, this is what it says, they reported briefly to those around Peter all that had been commanded. After these things, Jesus himself sent out through them from the east to west the holy and imperishable preaching of the eternal salvation. That's another ending. Amen. This shorter ending is usually included with the longer ending. However, it ends at this point. Most manuscripts include the longer ending immediately after verse 8, which has a different shorter ending between verses 14 and 15. It doesn't matter about... I know it's complicated when you're thinking about it. But, years of the crunch, Jerome and Eusebius, some of the early church fathers, knew of no other Greek manuscript that had the longer ending in it. It's an addition by a well-meaning scribe. He didn't like the way the gospel, the, the theory is, he didn't like the way the gospel ended suddenly, so he tacked on some extra scriptures. And it's well proven that the oldest manuscripts don't have it. It's not there. And the older manuscripts, the closer you get to the original writers, the more accurate they become. Now it's a fact. There's a few variant readings in Scripture. And if you've got a good Bible, you'll actually mark it out, not found. You'll often see a, a little footnote, not found in the NU texts or whatever. Now it's a problem now because now our charismatic and Pentecostal friends don't like this because they, you know what's contained in the longer end, isn't it? These signs will follow, will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons, they will speak in new languages. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and whatever poison they drink will not harm them. They will place their hands on the sick, and they will be well. Now, there's a lot of things contained there that actually did happen during the apostolic period, in fairness, didn't it? Paul got bitten by a snake, and they were all watching. Well, well let's watch him. Now he's going to drop on the floor and start foaming in the mouth, and nothing happened. I don't know about drinking poison. I don't think there's anything recorded there about that. The longer ending is contained in the AV and in the New King James Version. I don't know if it's in newer versions, but it's usually, like I say, it's got a, f a footnote. It's not contained in the older manuscripts. You know, there's people who have developed a complete doctrine on this in some churches in the United States. You've heard of them. They're carrying around with copper back rattlesnakes and waving them around. Look at us. We can pick up snakes. A lot of them have actually been killed <laughs> because they got bitten. The point is, right, I want my Bible, is, I want it to be the most accurate translation from the biblical language and the most accurate manuscripts. I want what the apostles wrote, don't I, at the end of that? I want some scribe have added to it. You know, even if his intentions were a good idea. Final point for today is the scripture is all we need for faith and practice. By that, by that I mean the scripture the early church read and accepted once the canon or the standard or the rule of scriptures was closed. The same with the Old Testament. I don't want the Apocrypha, okay? The Jews never accepted it. 
So why should I? I don't want the Mormons, another testament of Jesus Christ. I don't want the Quran either. The scripture says in Hebrews 1.1, as I've already said, that long ago, many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Okay? And like I said, that's good enough for me. Do you know what that means? It means the Quran is fake. It means the Book of Mormon is a fake. And the rest of their books, Muhammad and Joseph Smith and the others, were all false prophets. They were either hoodwinked or were, you know, by deceiving spirits or were deceivers themselves. The thing is, the importance of Scripture is throughout Scripture. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, even though he had the authority of God, yes. he chose to defer to Scripture, didn't he, every time? Luke 4, 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Luke 4, 8, get behind me, Satan, for it is written. 1 Peter 1, 16, because it is written, I am, I be holy for I am holy. Romans 3, 10, as it is written. Romans 9, 13, as it is written. Over and over again. You get the picture. That's why here we believe in the doctrine at, uh, in Latin, is sola scriptura which just means scripture alone, okay? I don't care about what men say or fanciful ideas that can't be backed up by scripture, or even if an angelic being should appear before you. Could you imagine that? And say something contrary to scripture? I won't believe it. Is a man come in? It's going to show genuine, great signs, wonders, and miracles. Call down fire from heaven. And he will deceive many. There's no doubt about it. But who will he deceive? Will he deceive you? Who is he going to deceive? The Pentecostal and charismatic movements, isn't he? Especially. We're chasing around the country and even the world looking for signs, wonders and revival. Don't you think they will fall for the false Christ when he turns up? If they believe the likes of the Kennys and the Bennies. I know they will will fall for this person. The Bible calls him the Antichrist, doesn't he? But we have to stand firm on the sure foundation of the Word of God and not budge from it. Yeah. Now, there's a lot more points that I'm going to get into, but I'm going to do that in another sermon. I've been going on a bit long here, so we'll end there. So, amen. Amen.